from the Irish. According to Deneen, a Gael unsurpassed in lexicographical enterprise, the Irish for moon means the white circle in a slice of half-boiled potato or turnip. A star is the mark on the forehead of a beast, and the sun is the bottom of a lake or a well. Well, if I say to you, your face is like a slice of half-boiled turnip, your hair is the colour of, the, of a lake's bottom, and at the centre of each of your eyes is the mark of the beast, it is because I want to love you properly, according to Denise. I'm so glad you picked that one. So I've probably told you before, that was my introduction to your work. I found that somewhere and I thought like, I love this so much. I tracked down your work after that and started reading you and it's mm -hmm. taken that long for us to actually, you know, figure out how to get a reading in Nottingham. Um, that's um, because of COVID, it was canceled last March. Um, the Irish connection, do you think that has something to do with your interest in language? I mean, obviously you're playing around with Irish English there. Yeah, it's certainly in language generally, but a big difference in coming from an Irish family is, uh, as opposed to my English friends, is that poetry it was highly valued there. You know, right. although it was a working class family, my parents, you know, my father was a labourer and my mother worked mm -hmm. in a shop. She valued poetry very much and she recited it all the time, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I could see the relevance, relevance of it. So, for example, the manga line, it was kind of political, you know, good luck to you, don't scorn the poor and don't be their despiser, for worldly wealth soon melts away and cheats the very miser, you know, and it was kind of class consciousness and there was poems about battles, you know, it was a day full of sorrow for Ulster when mm -hmm. Conor MacNessa went forth to fight with the chieftains of Conor who dared to take spoils from the north. So that was all around at home. So um, it, was, it was valued, it was something that didn't, uh, come to me from school or anywhere else mm -hmm. it was there and there was a sense that if you controlled your language Scarkle says something like this if you controlled language you could hold your own in any company you know um, and partly also I suppose uh, in a society where there was prejudice against Irish people in poetry the achievements of Irish poets had to be uh, allowed you know so it was something where you were coming from a position of strength, you know. Um, so all of those things made a big difference in my background. Um, and then as I got more involved and more interested in it, um, it was already there, you know. Um, mm. I said to somebody else, there's a sense, you know, there was lots of Irish songs as well. Mm. Uh, so, but there was a sense that the trajectory of a song is not unlike the trajectory of a poem. It's about the same sort of length. You know, you can kind of go into things uh, uh, and, and make an impression in that time. So that was all around me when I grew up. And as I say, it was something which was considered worthy of respect. Yeah. I you mentioned more than once that somebody said as a criticism in the hand list of late 20th century poets that your admiration of folk styles chased out literary interests almost altogether. That's and right. I mean, like you, I understand poetry and folk story, folk tale, folk song, intrinsically linked. Yeah. It's the same form, just different formats. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more, you know. I mean, now I suppose that you, I do different things with language and, and mm -hmm. see poems differently. And I think there is a difference uh, for me between poems that I read and then poems that I know will stay on the page. Um, yeah. Sometimes a poem is a visual thing as well, but yeah. nevertheless it seems to me that it comes from, or certainly the kind of poetry that I'm interested in, you know, um, non-standard cultures. I think very often uh, it's fed by folk traditions, uh, the art form of the people, mm -hmm. Um, it's different if you go to, um, if you pick up poetry at university or something like this, it's in a different social context. Um, so for me, it was very much in, in, in that sense. Yeah, you're inspired quite a lot by art. That's a, you have a lovely poem about the dancers, uh, the rustics outside an inn. 
There was also oh, yeah. this collection that you did with uh, Philippa Troutman, Digressions, yeah. where um, there's illustrations as part of the work. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a bit about this interest and inspiration from art? Well, I went to a Catholic school and, you know, art was not something that was on the agenda. Uh, it was, that was completely absent from my background. Um, but I left school at 16, um, uh, in a bit of a rush, shall we say. Um, and there was a gap while I was looking for work and things like this. And I used to go for walks. Um, and it wasn't that far to go to um, Hampstead Heath. And at Hampstead Heath, I was wandering around, I came upon Kenwood House. And Kenwood House had some fantastic paintings, you know, uh, Vermeer's. Uh, there was a late Rembrandt self-portrait. Um, and I remember standing in front of the Rembrandt self-portrait and counting how many colours he used on his nose and on his face, 30 or 40. Um, and there was something going on there that really drew me in. Um, this was not something where Rembrandt was trying to suck up to anybody, you know. This yeah. was Rembrandt uh, using his skill, using his art, using his face even as material to try mm -hmm. and capture something, to be interesting, to make something new, you know. Um, and I was very poor at art. And perhaps um, in the same way that I envy musicians, I envy artists. Um, and having tried to do both, I can see the gap between me and them. Um, I, uh, it's a bit like football, you know, it's like you appreciate other people who are very good at football when you're not so great. You know, I was a right back, I was not a creative player, I was a stopper. Um, but like, you know what other people are doing that you can't. Uh, and that sharpens your critical sense, you know. In poetry <laughs> too, you come up to a certain level and then you can see what other people are doing that you will never be able to do. And you can appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, and with that, there was rather more that I couldn't do for me to appreciate it. And it was a new world. And you mm -hmm. consumed it. And I suppose what was different was you consumed it in complete silence. Um, it, you just stood there and you tried to work out what was going on, why he did it that way, you yeah. know. Um, and it was a little bit like poetry. There was moments, you know. So, for example, in the Vermeer, the woman is looking at a letter. And so she raises her eyes slightly. She's holding the letter and she raises her eyes slightly. And you're left thinking, um, what's happened in the letter? What has she been told? Um, and in the same way that uh, a poem is compressed, you have to leave lots of reverberations. If it's going to be interesting, it has to have a life beyond the page. You have to make people think further than the immediate words. And that was happening in the Vermeer as well. I was coming away thinking, I spent ages thinking, what would have been in that letter? I couldn't even work out if it was good news or bad news, you know. Um, and that fed into poetry in a way as well. Um, when I was working with Philippa Troutman, um, it was to do with um, Tristram Shandy. It was a tercentenary of Stern's birth. Um, and he, he makes lots of analogies in relation to uh, painting. Yeah. Uh, he uses lots of visual devices like the white page, you know, for uh, this woman is so beautiful that if I try and describe her, then it will be a disappointment. So you mm -hmm. fill in what you think is the most mm -hmm. beautiful woman. The black page for when Yorick dies, this is just so sad, mm -hmm. uh, you know, again. Um, so that side of it, you know, it's what goes, um, for me, it's what goes on around language as well and how we think, how I think visually. Um, although you have to think as a poet uh, in terms of words and, or, and have an auditory imagination, I think visual, visual uh, stimuli are powerful for me. And I got a lot out of it. And it wasn't a subject I studied at school. So I didn't have that hanging over me, you know, in the same way that poetry was something that I came from my family. Uh, it wasn't part of an educational process, which I was going to be marked on, you know. I could just yeah. go and enjoy it. Um, so it was important from that point of view as well. Yeah. I, I follow you on social media, as you know. Um, I notice you use medieval art a lot. Yeah. And you're very interested in the medieval. I mean, you're not alone in Irish poets, Catherine Byron, Bernard O'Donoghue, Seamus Heaney. Um, yeah. Can you tell me a bit about your medieval interest? I don't honestly know where that came from. Yeah. Um, I think... Part of the Catholic heritage is saints get weirder 
the folk <laughs> unions were that back in the past, you know. And by the Middle Ages, all sorts of weird things are going on with saints. You know, the stories they tell, what they're able to do. But it's also a society where there is a kind of coherence around what, you know, saints are supposed to do mm. as well. Um, and um, I, I return to it over and over again from different angles. I mean, I think, um, what's the name of the Italian novelist, name of the rose, that book, Echo. He says that everything in the modern world was in place in the Middle Ages. Um, mm. all, of the, all of the major social structures, that, you know, like, the universities, which I often think remind me of the church, you know, mm -hmm. um, monasteries are like universities, centers of learning. Mm -hmm. um, the big threats to a coherent faith were coming from the point, you know, plague. Um, if you're supposed to believe in God, um, why are people, good people being wiped out for no reason by these plagues? The church was having to grapple with that. We had to grapple with the very same issues now. Um, so it was in some way far enough away to be exotic, but also the concerns were very close to the concerns that we have now. Um, it could be funny. Uh, I enjoy Rabelais very much. Uh, it could be marvellous. Um, the, even in the, there's a Bunuel film, and actually he's talking about his ideal martini, and he uses an image from um, Thomas Aquinas, where Thomas Aquinas explains how the Virgin Mary became pregnant uh, because light came through the glass. In the same way that light can come through the glass and what's inside the glass can be affected by the light, that's the way Mary became pregnant. And for Bunuel, that was his idea for how, how much vermouth you have in a martini. You just let the light fall through the bottle into the glass. It's off the light here behind me. <laughs> so um, it, it was, I suppose that was it. It wasn't something that was in my background really, except mm -hmm. through the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. But the more I looked into it, I had both a sense of feeling strangely familiar with this world, but also it was terribly exotic, you know. Mm -hmm. You mentioned humour there, and humour is a really strong feature in your work, and I love that because there seems to be a kind of a feeling out there about like good poetry can't be funny, which is you know, rubbish, of course. Yes, that's certainly true. Um, I, there's a certainly uh, a lot of people think that it's inappropriate that poetry should be humorous. Um, uh, and I can understand the idea that there should be finer sentiments that are explored, that sometimes uh, uh, a laugh is not, um, uh, destroys that. But I don't, I believe that can, they can live side by side. Mm -hmm. I think you can have different kinds of poems. Mm -hmm. um, and if you go to poetry, as I did, the more I got interested in it, as some kind of relief from the world. I mean, my background for a long time was working with homeless people. It was very often terrible stories during the day. Uh, mm -hmm. People's lives, when, you know, all, very many, many people go through terrible experiences in their lives. And then coming away with poetry, I like it to be, um, uh, to draw me out, to be uh, the, the wonderful music of the language. But I also like the hilarity of poets like Paul Durkin, for example, you know, uh, just going in mad places and, mm -hmm. and you know, I mean, there's lots of good humour, I suppose. So I think there's room for both in it. Yeah. You mentioned place there. There's a strong sense of place in your um, writing. I mean, in that book, I wouldn't start from here. Your essay is called The Road. And yeah. lots of um, place poems, I would say. You mentioned the River Air a lot. You write about Leeds, about the place. You have a strong sense of place. I do, but in the same way that it's, I always think that poets, you can eat your cake and have it as a poet, you know, you have silence and you have sound, you have all of the senses, you know, you could have stories and then you don't have to spell them out, you know, yeah. and I think uh, with the road, it's a place, but it's also not a place, it's moving through places. Mm -hmm. um, in my last book, I was uh, amazed to discover, I still am amazed to discover, that one of the roads I get into town from here was made by a blind man. 
that's absolutely astonishing you know uh, it's known by some people but not that many my son was doing voluntary work in a, a center for blind people uh, none of the staff had ever heard of jack metcalf you know um, a major road builder in the north um, but for me i suppose once again he made roads but the blind man's road seems to me also to work at the level of um a metaphor that it's like uh, on the one hand the practical level when our parents came over if you were economic migrants um, you don't know anything about the new place except that there might be a chance of giving your children a better life mm -hmm. there might be a chance of work and my father worked most of his life over here in a milk bottling plant but he grew up in the country uh, then he joined the Irish army. He didn't think I'm going to go over somewhere else and work in a milk bottling plant, you know. Um, didn't know much about London, you know. Same with Leeds. In the communities along the Blind Man's Road, people came there from St. Kitts or Poland. Um, they didn't think I'm going to go to Leeds and work in light industry yeah. or anything like that. You know, you, you knew that there was a possibility of feeding your children. Uh, yeah. possibility of educating your children of living in a place where they will be looked after by uh, that you know a health system and so there's that that's a, you're on a blind your parents were on a blind man's road blind people's road but also like love i felt the same about love too you start out with someone you don't really know where your life together is going to go you don't really know to be perfectly honest what your relationship is going to be like 10 years 15 years 20 years mm -hmm. down the line you know so it's it's eating as i said eating your cake and having a road takes you somewhere mm -hmm. and you get on it for a reason but that doesn't mean that you really know at all where the road is going to take you so the sense of both place as being location uh, specific uh, information about place and at the same time mystery surrounded by things that you just don't know so that's that's the thing about place for me I'm very very interested in place and very interested in the fact that it can just evaporate you know yeah. uh, Mike Blind Jack the fact that people didn't know him I find astonishing yeah, that's such a brilliant story. That's, yeah. He had to figure out his own kind of engineering, if you like, how yeah. to make this road across the bog. And yeah. so many Irish connections there with road making and crossing bogs yeah. and memory. It yeah. is, yeah, it is fantastic. But I know you wrote a poem um, for the unveiling of his statue, was it? In, yeah. Uh, he was actually born in Nasborough. Mm -hmm. So although he worked all over the north of England and he worked here, he was born in Nasborough and it was mm -hmm. the 200th anniversary um, mm -hmm. there. Um, and in Nasborough, my, probably my favourite story about Blind Jack is that as well as being a road maker, he was also uh, a fiddler. He was a guide. Mm -hmm. Um, a guide at night, which is not as mad as it sounds. I mean, he was a, if you wanted to travel 24 hours, sometimes people did, uh, it, so you could travel at night with Brian Jack as well. But he was a fiddler in big houses, and uh, he was engaged to play at a wedding, and he ran off with Bride, you know. And a massive scandal, massive scandal, as you can imagine, you know. And uh, long after that settled down back in Nasborough, and people talked to his wife and they said to her, what on earth led you, you know, to run off with a, a, a blind fiddler, you know? And she said he was more full of life than any man I ever met. Um, and I think that is profoundly true about what I know about Jack, but also the secret of a kind of attraction, you know? We're not here that long, whatever life is, um, we must fill ourselves. If we're going to make use of the time that we have to fill ourselves with life, find out what is there for life. And this is back with me, poetry and art and all the rest of it, you know. These are the things that make me feel full of life in this world for the period that I'm here. Well, it does, certainly does come across in your poetry, but there's a, a great story about him actually being a, a, a driving a coach and horses. And, uh, you know, when he's blind, we yeah. are so limited by what we can and can't do. And he was just going beyond this. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, the, 
element of class that you talk about, like your parents, you, you, you mention it a lot. And one of your most famous poems, I suppose, is the Lammas hireling. Mm -hmm. There's um, a, a sense there of that um, you're telling a story of from I mean you know in the Lammas hireling the voice is the farmer but the empathy is with the hireling mm. can you tell me a bit about how class affects your work well I think it's the idea the hireling is a casual labor you yeah know? um uh, and very often their stories are ignored um mm. uh when I was uh, asked to write something for the anniversary of um uh Alice in Wonderland I decided to write about Pat, the Irish navvy who works for the White Rabbit, you know. Um, and, the, and here I suppose the folk tradition comes in is the culture of uh, the people at the bottom, um, the itinerant labourers and all the rest of it. Mm. Uh, Brodsky has uh, something in one of his essays where he talks about the song of the nomad as opposed to the prose of the settler. And I think that the, the nomad, the itinerant labourer, uh, their culture is song, it's poetry, it's what is portable. Um, as often has been said, you can have a poem in your mind and that's as good as it ever gets. It doesn't get improved by writing it out in neat handwriting or anything like that. You have it perfect in your mind, even in a way that a song might not be quite the same you know you can have a good version of a song in your mind but if you have a poem in your mind it's perfect and um, memory allows you to keep that with you um so it's a lost culture uh, it's a culture which even in the course of my lifetime i think that the working class uh are despised in a way um that they weren't in my youth i felt that you know uh, my father was very active in the Labour Party. I remember he took me to, uh, when I was very young, I went to hear Jim Callaghan speak in Paddington in support of the local MP. The local Labour MP was very active against the Rackman, you know, housing issue once again. Um, and th that kind of culture now is utterly disregarded you know i mean one of the problems i have with many people as i say tell me what aspect of working class culture do you value tell me when you think about the working class of this society what is it about their lives that you think is important what do they do that you think is beautiful you know where does beauty reside in the lives of people at the bottom of society as it's viewed in that way um, and for me, I think it's part of my job as a poet to find that, to find what is um, important and mm -hmm. wonderful and beautiful in that tradition. You know, I, I'm forever quoting a bit, uh, it's Johnson in Rasselas, where he says, nothing to a poet, nothing can be useless. Uh, and I think the knowledge uh, that surrounds you, uh, certainly uh, in my background but also when I work with people who may be manual laborers and things like this that kind of knowledge um, can be tremendous like one of the things I found out which I've used and in, the, in my last poem I'll relate to it was that they used to use book pulp on the when you make roads you know because it helps the road bed down properly this is where all my books are going to go I know you know but uh, that's the sort of thing which I think is a fantastic image you know um, and I used it and uh, a composer called Christopher Fox uh, actually made a piece of music called um, The Dark Road. And he used um, recordings with uh, the Irish community in Leeds and they feature in the background of his piece of music, you know. Um, so that's it. I think it's about valuing a disregarded section of the community that even in my life I have seen come to be despised in the ordinary course of events, you know. Makes me angry when I think about it now, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, and how making things, that was, you know, so much part of what our parents grew up with and our grandparents, and we just don't seem to be able to do things like that anymore. And how manual labour ever became um, a kind of an insult almost is beyond me. You know, they had such craft and knowledge, as you say there. But I mean, it was, it was the, the manual labourers uh, would very often in the evening play traditional Irish music. Mm -hmm. So the same hands that were sort of tearing lumps out of the road and 
mm. uh, you know, using a, a, a drill. Uh, in the evening, we'll be, you know, caressing a fiddle or a flute. Mm. And the tiniest variations in finger movement makes, as you know, all of the difference to how, how a tune is rendered and all the rest of it, you know. So the same hands that will do these things would make the most beautiful music later on in the same day very often you know very few people who worked on the roads when i was a kid uh, were able to you know live as musicians it was something you did in the evening mm -hmm. um uh, now lots of people when i go to listen to irish music now it's it's often the the children of that generation who play it and they play it very very well indeed and very often they're salaried people professionals or they work in universities and all the rest of it um it's just it's the same music and the same tradition but it doesn't have that sense of the miraculous for me that when i saw people who uh were digging roads making that music making beautiful music it, that seemed to me extraordinary um and i'm glad that people are continuing it to play it and all the rest of it uh, and as I say, we get a wonderful musical tradition in Leeds. Um, but that's kind of gone from it, you know. <laughs> and no doubt their children would say they're glad because, like, you want to be brought up. You know, you don't want to be digging roads. You know, that in itself is not a good thing. And the kind of production of um, stories as well, because that kind of sitting around, I know we uh, sentimentalise it, but, you know, the working people I knew in the evenings, they would talk to one another, they would tell stories, and they were never so busy that a neighbour would call that you wouldn't sit and chat and have a cup of tea with them, and the kind of stories we love to listen to. And now we're just waiting for somebody else to make stories for us on television or radio. And I know there's a place there for that, and writers can work in that as well, but these people are making their own stories and passing them on. Yeah. You know, they weren't looking for somebody else to entertain them. They were making their own kind of stories and folklore as they went on. And that, but also when a new person came in, they had a new story. Yeah, you know, they had news. They were they were valuable from that point of view. Yeah, it's like you would pay attention to that story, and that added to your collection. It added yeah. to your story riches. You know, yeah. they would tell you things that were wonderful as far as you were concerned. You know, um, and so there was a kind of and you know there was a reason to be generous to a certain extent to outsiders. I'm not going to sentimentalise it, mm -hmm. but even if they didn't have money, you know they had stories and maybe they would have tunes as well, but they would certainly have a new way of looking at things that you could actually use, you know, uh, and the interest in stories, the interest in narrative um, uh, goes back a long way, but, you know, until pretty recently it was, it was still there. We get it instantaneously now. That's it. You know, you're not sitting around, you know, making shoes or something like this, and then somebody comes along and it's a chance for a break and a chat. Now it's all served up to you, which is obviously a fantastic thing because learning comes with it. Um, but you're not as hungry for a new story as you were because you will have dozens from everywhere anytime yeah. you want, you know. It's not quite the currency the way no. it was. No. We've run out of time. Well, <laughs> Do you have another yeah. poem for a scene? Yes, this is the poem I mentioned. It's, uh, it's called Roisin Bourne. Um, um, there used to be a pub down the road in Leeds called the Roscoe, uh, which was a great centre of Irish music. And this is about that really. Um, and it's about Darak O'Kahan. Darak O'Kahan, the rich and no singer. Um, Roisin Bourne. The M1 laid, they laid us off. We stayed where it ran out in Leeds, a white rose town in love with roads. Its skin is smooth, its locals rough. Some nights we drink in Chapel Town, a place not known for Gwailagors, to hear O'Kahan sing Shannos, O'Reilly gave him the crown. Though most were lost by Roisin Dove, all knew his heart was rich and strange in a pub we drowned with our black stuff when we laid the sheep's car into change. Pulp's books help asphalt stick to roads and cuts down traffic sound as well. Between the lines a navvy reads black seas of words 
they did not sell. 